Today we're going to be talking about thermal cameras and specifically this, the P2 Pro from Infrared. Now thermal cameras are used for many things but they have become almost a necessity in board repair. Thermal cams allow you to see things that you wouldn't ordinarily be able to see and today I'm going to walk you through some of the features and capabilities of this one and explain to you why I chose to buy this camera. Now just to be clear, I did not receive this camera from Infray, although I did manage to buy it at a little bit of a discount from a Discord server called Clean Unbox. They were able to support me in ordering this from AliExpress and there will be a link to that Discord server in the description of this video as well if you're interested in getting one. I also want to say a massive thank you to the person who runs that Discord server. They also have a YouTube channel as well and I'll put a link to that in the description of this video as well. Please do check it out. Please do subscribe. Again, there is a discount available on certain units via them if you choose to order it from them via their AliExpress store. Now, what we're going to do today, first of all, is take a closer look at the camera itself. I'll then walk you through some of its features and capabilities. And then at the end, I will share with you my personal thoughts, having spent some time with it. OK, so the P2 Pro from Infray is a small USB-C thermal camera for smartphones and tablets. The device itself weighs just nine grams and it has a thermal resolution of 256 by 192 and an update refresh rate of 25 hertz. Now the reason I ordered this camera over some of the others that are available on the market is that it has one nice additional feature and that is that you can use it with this a macro lens. When you get the camera as standard it comes like this and this is the standard thermal lens but there's this additional macro lens that you can get that allows you to use it much closer to subjects than you would ordinarily and this is what makes it ideal for the use in electronics. If we get in nice and close you can now see that we have that thermal camera view on the front and then there's this USB-C port on the bottom. Now this USB-C port is fixed I do know that there are some thermal cameras out there where it will rotate. However, in this one, it is fixed, but it does work both ways. So you can pop it into your smartphone one way or the other, and it will work absolutely fine. It features an all metal external housing, which makes it nice and robust. And it has, as I've said, this magnetic macro lens option that allows you to get up and close. And the way this fits is it simply slots over the top and locks in place with magnets. Now, this camera has a measurement range of minus 20 to plus 550 degrees C with a accuracy rate of plus minus two degrees and as I've said it's got a thermal resolution of 256 by 192. Using this with a smartphone is very easy you would simply plug it into the USB-C port at the bottom now as I've said depending on what orientation you want to use it so for instance here I'm going to use it with it pointing backwards you simply plug it in and then you open up the app. Now app wise I have found that there are two different ones available there's one called P2 Pro and there's another one called Infrared Go. Now I have tested both of these and they both offer pretty much the same features it's just choosing the one that you prefer over the other. Today we're going to use Infrared for a grow. Once you've opened the app, you can see that it will connect. So for instance, if I just lift it here off the bench, you can see that we're now looking down where my hand was. That is the residual heat. For instance, if I put my hand in front of it, you can then see that thermal image. And if I move my hand away, you can then see where that was. Now, whilst I'm not going to walk you through every feature and capability on the app, you do have features such as the ability to take still images, take video of the thermal imagery. We can do things like set temperature points on the screen and measure specific areas, put lines across the screen to measure zones, put squares on to track items, as well as remove those things as well. You can also go into the options and change the color palette just like you would be able to do on any other thermal camera. So we can set it to white hot, iron red and all of the usual options that we would expect to find on a thermal camera. And infrared also give us some nice options such as this pro mode that I'm in now or you can go back to a very basic mode that just gives you the normal basic thermal imaging controls. 
Now, as I have mentioned, you also have the option of that macro lens. For instance, here, we're looking at my table. You can see the cameras and everything around there. And on this table, you have a flight controller. Whilst this shows it OK, if I now move in closer and closer and closer, you'll start to see the image get very blurry and we won't really be able to use it for diagnostic purposes on failed components. However, if I now install the macro lens and move the camera back out to where it was before, you can see everything is now blurry. However, if we now move in closer, we'll now be able to see all of the components on that PCB and we'll now be able to use this for diagnostics on boards such as this and allow us to see exactly what is going on even with the smallest components. Just to show you how the room looks through the thermal image here, we're looking vertically. What's really interesting is you can see where I was, but also you can even see the vertical timbers on the other side of the wall. There we have my printers that have been both in action. The Prusa in the background is currently still printing and the Snapmaker has just finished. You can see looking at the beds where the heat is. The Prusa is about halfway through a print and the Snapmaker has just finished a benchy and you can see the bed starting to cool. Here we're looking at my monitor as well as my PC again just showing you what you can get from the thermal image. This is some of the recording from the app rather than it be a screen recording looking at my consumer unit and then moving across to my inverter and showing you my Raspberry Pi that uploads the data online showing you the heat difference obviously it's night when I'm recording this you can see the inverter is cold but the Pi is clearly hot. Also, just showing you a plug of a high power device. This is drawing about 12 amps and you can see that being reflected in its thermal output. Now officially this camera is only designed to be used with Android based smartphones. However, we have found a PC app that does allow you to use it. Now this app isn't actually made by the company that makes the camera, but it is based on a camera that uses the same thermal core. I will put a link to that in the description and we're hopefully going to see more and more PC based applications coming for this in the future. And whilst this app might not have all of the same functionality that you can get via the Android app, we will hopefully see some very nice apps being made for this in the near future by the community that should give us a lot more features as well. But it is nice to see that there is a PC solution for this now as well. Next, I want to walk you through some use cases of this thermal camera in electronics and board repair. Predominantly, what I'm going to be showing you is in FPV, but the process is exactly the same regardless of what kind of electronic repair you're doing. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is try and diagnose what is going on with this VTX module. This is an Avatar Whoop VTX module that I actually killed. At the moment, it's not working at all. So the first thing we're going to do is do some basic tests with a multimeter. I've currently got it set on resistance mode and we're just going to check the power inputs to see what we're getting. Let me just get on to the right spot. There we go. We're on the positive and negative. And as you can see, we're getting 0.4 of an ohm. So that is telling us the voltage input to this VTX is basically shorted. What we'll now do though is hook it up to a power supply and then we'll take a look at it under the thermal camera to try and see what is actually going on. Okay, so what I've now done is connected up the board to a power supply. What we'll then do is set it to a specific voltage output. So we're going to say 4.5 volts at one amp and click start. If we then look at the readings on this power supply or charger, it's capable of both. We can see that it's dragged the output voltage down to 0.48 and it's straight drawing one amp of current. That is telling me that there is a short on the board. Now, if I just push that back and put my finger around the board a little bit, there's nothing I can feel that is getting particularly hot and that will be because of the low voltage level that we're getting and what we will need to do is lift the restriction of current that's going in but before we do that what we'll do is turn that off and do the same test again but showing you it with the thermal camera okay so i've let the pcb cool back to room temperature and what we're now going to do is have a look at it under the thermal if i just show you it now here 
you can basically not distinguish it from whatever else is around it, including the table. So what we're going to do is power up the voltage regulator. You can now see that the device there is starting to get hot on that side of the board. If I just go in closer, you can see that that chip there is clearly getting hot in that top corner. We're getting a reflection off that MIPI. There is some reflection off the IC, which is causing a show in temperature, but you can see more than anything that it's that IC there that's getting hot. If we now just up the current that is available to this, so rather than it being one amp, we're gonna let it now draw up to say 1.5 amp and we may start to see that temperature increase even further. In fact, what we'll do is start sending it to go up to two amp and we'll drop the voltage up a little bit more to five volt. And if we just go back to the main screen, now we're getting two amp and 1.4 volts on the charger. And it's definitely that IC there that is getting hot specifically in that top corner. Okay, now just to show you that chipset that is getting hot, it is this one here, which is the Dialog DA9062. Now, this is a system management IC or a multiple voltage regulator or BEC. If we look at the top, you can see that there's coils here. And if we look at the bottom, we can see that there's coils here as well. This is providing all of the voltages needed for the main SOC, which is here, the RAM chip on the other side. And this device is specifically sensitive to voltage spikes. In fact, I have seen this regulator fail on a number of Avatar VTXs, not specifically the 1S, but a number of others. It does have a voltage input rating, I think, of 5.5 volt max. This is, though, what is now obviously shorted, and that is what is going to ground, meaning that we're not getting any power on our unit. Now, the only way to fix this VTX will be to replace this IC. On a normal Avatar VTX, there's actually multiple voltage regulators. You've got a five volt regulator first that provides the five volt to this IC, and then this IC providing the power out from there. However, because this is a 1S board, we simply have this main IC here. There is another transistor on this side of the board that does also look like a voltage regulator. We've got an IC here and we've got another coil. So this does look like another BEC, but I've done some checks on this and it seems okay. It is the case that it is this one here that is shorted to ground and that is what is killing our input. Now, the next thing I just want to show you is an issue on a flight controller that I've got, which is this one here. And that is that one of the UR inputs doesn't work properly and it's actually shorted and it's not allowing it to receive an input. Now, as a result of that, it means it wouldn't work on that UR with MSP OSD. It's something that I spotted after having a damaged ear unit and that actually damaged the flight controller. What's quite interesting though, is that you can actually see this short in the main chip and where it specifically is. Because normally a piece of silicon like this will get hot all over. So whilst these are different chips, you would expect them to warm up in a uniform way and not a very specific way like I'll show you in a minute. But what I will show first is how it looks on this Holy Bro flight controller. I know it's not the same I see, but it gives you a bit of an overview of how it can look compared to the other. So what I'm gonna do is plug in the USB, put the thermal camera over it again, and now just start to show you how that looks. Now that chip you're seeing there in the middle, that is the main flight control chipset. That is the H7 on this. And you can see if I go in close that the heat is pretty uniform in the middle. You can see the outline of the chipset, and you can see that the heat is all emanating from that center area. If I go over to that other chipset there as well, you can see 
it is very much the same. However, if we now do something like bring this thing online and power this up, and I'll do this one off a battery rather than doing it off the USB because it's a different USB connector. And now if I go in on this one, you'll start to see something interesting. If I just go in closer, you can see the outline of the chip, which is the STM32, but you can see that there is a very specific hot spot in that IC compared to everything around it. Whilst you do have that area that is warming around the IC, you can see that that area there, right there, on that area is a massive hot spot, and that is very likely where the short is in that component. Now, if we come down here, you can see some of the other components get hot around it. That there is a voltage regulator. We've got our OSD chipset there, which is running pretty cool, and everything else around it is running pretty cool. But you can clearly see that there's a very noticeable hot spot on that chipset in that very specific place. Now, just to compare that to another F4 that I actually have, I've pulled this quad apart and I'm just gonna move it over so we can start to look at it on the thermal and I will put this up on the screen. But as you can see, no hot spots in the main chipset itself. Everything is very uniform in the center. That temperature in the center is increasing overall. It's more like a bulge and there isn't a very specific spot like we have seen on that other flight controller. Just before I share with you my thoughts on the P2 Pro, I just want to talk about pricing. This camera costs roughly $250 for the standard unit or about $280 with that macro lens. I think it's priced very, very competitively and it really is in the same ballpark as some of the other thermal cameras we've seen. Okay, so to share with you my thoughts, having spent some time with this camera over the last few months. Now there is a lot to like here. The price is good. I like the size and shape, I like the fact that it does do 25 hertz, and I like the features the app has as well. I also think the macro lens option is fantastic and it really is a very good camera for electronic repair and testing on the bench. Whilst there's a lot to like, I have spotted a few issues and downsides with this camera as well. For instance, I am finding it is refreshing the sensor or calibrating the sensor an awful lot, more than I'm used to on a few other cameras. Also, I've noticed that the temperature reading whilst using the Android app doesn't seem the most accurate. For instance, at lower than say 70 degrees temperatures, it seems absolutely fine. I've tested it on multiple different surfaces and it seems to read fairly accurately. However, when I test this above 80 degrees, say in the 80 to 100 area, it seems to actually overread by as much as 40 degrees. What's a bit odd about this is it seems to be related to the Android app, because when I try it with that PC app, the temperatures actually look far more accurate at the higher end. However, at the lower end, it doesn't seem to be affected regardless of what app it is. It's also been a massive pain up until now that it was Android only and we didn't have a PC application. However, that is changing. We now have this unofficial app and I do know we're going to have apps from the community in the near future as well that is going to allow you to unlock all of the features and capabilities of this unit in that environment. Overall, regardless of those issues, I think it is a very, very good thermal camera. Considering the cost, I think it's a bit of a bargain and if you're looking for a thermal camera for the bench or after a portable thermal camera that you can use in your daily work life or even hobby use, then it is well worth a look. Now, that's it from me on this one. I really do hope you have found this video interesting. I'm really interested in your thoughts on this camera. Please do let me know in the comment section. Also, if you have found this video interesting, please do make sure you are subscribed to the channel. And if you'd like to support us to allow us to keep buying equipment like this, because as I did say, we did buy this camera, please do consider checking out the link to my Patreon as well as buy me a coffee in the description. It is only through the support of my Patreons am I able to keep making content on this channel. And if you'd like to keep supporting us to allow us to buy this type of equipment, please do consider checking it out. Anyway, that's it from me. Stay safe. Please do let me know what you think in the comment section and I will speak to you soon.